the spring of 1945. As the Allies roll across Germany, liberating POW camps in their path, a British airman, Lieutenant Gerald Imerson, emerges from years in difficult captivity. On his wrist, he wears a gleaming Rolex Oyster chronograph. Not only was it a top-of-the-line piece, but it was also new. So how was such a high-end timepiece present at that moment, under such conditions? It's a mystery to be unraveled. But first, a bit of history. The name, Rolex, is now instantly recognizable as a maker of luxury timepieces. Although now a Swiss company, Rolex was actually founded in 1905. His name was Hans Wilsdorf. Wilsdorf chose the name Rolex because its phonetic spelling sounded the same when spoken in many languages. Over the years, Rolex helped establish its heritage by offering what are sometimes referred to as tool watches, purpose-built for specific activities, such as exploration, aviation, and deep-sea diving. One of the lesser-known aspects of Rolex's history is its past association with the armed forces of the United Kingdom for which it produced a special military version of its submariner. Beginning in the late 1950s, Rolex supplied a version of its submariner to the Ministry of Defense that was issued to Royal Navy divers. In 1971, the MOD approached Rolex to supply a new watch that would become known as the Mill Sub. Reference 5513 and later 5517. The MOD had a number of specifications for the watch. It had to be fitted with fixed lug bars, so that it would be secure on the wrist. These would be paired with a rugged but lightweight nylon strap. The hack feature allowing the precise setting of the time was another specific request. Furthermore, the model would have a unique bezel with 60-minute marks all the way round. Produced from the years 1971 to 1979, the mill sub had distinctive sword hands for ease of legibility. The luminous dial had to show the international symbol for tritium, a T in a circle. Only about 1,200 mill subs were issued during the entire nine-year run. Of these, only an estimated 180 are thought to still exist to this day. This extreme rarity makes the Millsub among the most sought-after models by collectors. The watches were often kept by servicemen, and later handed down to their heirs. Many examples have been modified or altered with service parts. An all-original example has become one of the holy grails of Rolex collectors. They are typically found with a creamy yellow patina on the dial, and can sell for well into the six figures depending on condition. One of the finest examples was sold in 2019 by Philips. It even came with its owner's original dive log and diver's knife. It sold for more than 218,000 US dollars. But long before the 1970s era mill sub, Rolex had a much earlier history with the armed forces. During the Second World War, Wilsdorf looked for ways to support the war effort against the Axis powers. The early years of the war for Britain were quite grave. Most international trade had been disrupted, and a total mobilization meant most regular commerce was not possible. Beginning in 1939, he offered his Rolex watches to officers of the armed forces that could be purchased on credit. The generous terms allowed many officers, who would otherwise not have been able to afford the timepieces, to purchase them on a modest wartime salary. Many RAF pilots took Wilsdorf up on his offer and placed orders for a variety of different Rolex models. In addition to their regular military-issued watches, a few of these personal Rolexes would sometimes accompany the airmen on missions, including fighter engagements during the Battle of Britain. The watches were also worn on long-range bombing runs over Nazi Germany. An accurate timepiece was useful when navigating, knowing when over a target, and for estimating fuel range. Inevitably, pilots would be shot down over enemy territory and be taken prisoner. Flight Lieutenant Gerald Imerson was captured by the Germans after his Vickers Wellington bomber made an emergency landing just off the coast of Belgium. Lieutenant Imerson did not yet own a Rolex when his mission was aborted over the North Sea. But soon, he would. The Germans would send prisoners to specific camps where they were to wait out the duration of the war. Lieutenant Imerson, like many airmen, was sent to Starlag Luft III, located in Silesia, what is now Poland. Starlag Luft III was made famous by a meticulously planned mass breakout, later depicted in the 1963 film, The Great Escape, directed by John Sturges. Inside the camps, military-issued watches were often seized by camp leaders for fear they might contain a compass, or something particularly useful for escape. 
but that didn't mean airmen couldn't order new watches via international mail. During captivity, officers in the camps were generally shown leniency by the camp guards. So much so, that there was a gentleman's agreement that airmen could receive care packages and other international mail. Care packages containing food and other items were facilitated by the International Committee of the Red Cross, via their headquarters in Geneva. Red Cross packages were a lifeline to officers in captivity, and provided all manner of the tastes of home. Unbeknownst to the guards, they were also used to bring certain items into the camp needed for the escape plan. Camp guards even allowed airmen to take advantage of the standing offer by Hans Wilsdorf, allowing British officers to order watches on credit. Servicemen would send postcards to Wilsdorf in Geneva, noting their circumstances and whereabouts, as well as which model they would like. The watches would sometimes take up to a year to arrive. They were often accompanied by a handwritten letter from Wilsdorf himself, instructing them not to even think about payment, until after the war had been won. It was through this program that Lieutenant Imerson ordered his Rolex. The piece was an oyster chronograph, reference 3525. It had a waterproof oyster shell case with radium-filled hands and numerals, allowing its wearer to read the time in complete darkness. On the night of the escape, Imerson, wearing his chronograph, waited to head through one of the tunnels. He was the 172nd man in the queue. Calculating how long it would take the men to crawl through the tunnel, as well as timing the patrols of the camp guards required a precise and reliable instrument, and Imerson's Rolex was not the only one worn by the airman that night. As he waited his turn to head through the tunnel, Imerson may have sensed that time was running out. The tunnel turned out to be short of the wooded area needed for cover, slowing the escape. In the end, only 76 men made it out before a camp guard spotted the attempt. Of those, only three would reach neutral territory and gain their freedom. Imerson survived the vicious reprisals exacted by the Germans. Half the men recaptured were executed. As the Soviet army approached in early 1945, prisoners were forced to make a difficult march further into German territory. Eventually, they would be liberated from another camp further west. During both the long marches and the final liberation, Imerson always had the watch on his wrist. He would survive the war and return home to his wife Leslie, where they would have four children and nine grandchildren. He would continue to wear the watch until his death in 2003 at the age of 85. As for Hans Wilsdorf, he had no children, and left no heirs, upon his death in 1960. Whether he ultimately collected on every watch ordered on credit by service men during the war is an open question. Today, the company is organized as a private Swiss charitable foundation. It has no legal requirement, under Swiss law, to disclose financial performance, or its donations. If you would like more short histories like this one, please hit the like button to let us know. And be sure to subscribe to our channel so you won't miss further episodes. Thanks for watching.